I'd like to acknowledge Australia's First Nation people as the traditional custodians of the land, and for this episode in particular, the Palawa people. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I've been telling people to age the beer for years, but no one listens. So I thought I'm going to release an aged beer and show them what I'm talking about. Unbelievable. Can you imagine the sense of, sense of satisfaction of sending this back beer back to people who had rejected it seven years ago and then have them tell you that's the best beer they've ever tasted? This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Ashley Huntington is an extraordinary soul. Owner of Two Metre Tall Brewing, he is the jack of all trades with a mind that works in truly fascinating ways. Today, ale is the tale, and on his piece of land in the Derwent Valley of Tasmania, Ashley crafts some of the most thought-provoking, interesting, and downright tasty beverages in Australia. Hi, Ashley. Thanks for joining me. Good to be here. Lovely sunny day down here in the Derwent. I bet. Sounds like a little piece of heaven down there. Ashley, thank you for taking the time out today. With just yourself and your wife, Jane, operating the business, I imagine that having a little pause in work doesn't come about that often. Uh, Well, it it comes about when we want it to come about, um, assuming we're not sort of knee-deep in liquid. Um, One of the joys of running your own business, I think, is running running your own timetable. Uh, So, uh, look, I'm happy talking to you at 12.30 12.30 as I am sort of digging out mash tons at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I very much appreciate it. Ashley, I've heard uh, a little bit about, you know, your history and it's pretty fascinating. Do you mind just, you know, bringing the listeners up to speed on how you kind of found your way into brewing farmhouse ale and cider down in the Derwent Valley? You've got such an interesting history in terms of all the study that you've done. So ha- give us a little lowdown of, of how you found your way into doing what you do. Uh, look, i tell you what, uh, it's certainly not – I'm certainly not a graduate of Business 101. Um, how did I find oh, – look, I found myself here. L- literally, it's a complete and utter mistake. Um, there was no thought behind it, really. Uh, I came – I returned – uh, the only deliberate decision was that I, I bought my farm. We were living in France at the time, and I bought the property because I thought it was the uh, best two-hectare vineyard site I'd, I'd seen. It was inconveniently attached to 600 hectares, um, and I put my tiny little cloth bag of eight shekels on the table and <laughs> it went into an enormous uh, debt. <laughs> To procure this piece of um, heaven, um, and my only intention was to plant a vineyard. Um, look, uh, that two hectares is still one of the best vineyard sites I've ever seen. It and it still doesn't have any grapes on it. But that's a statement of fact. If you if you ask the good uh, if you ask Italians and, and, and people like this that that, that sort of do this do this type of work uh, naturally and uh, I make that I, I make that distinction because w- we uh, we white Australians do this because it's trendy but they do it because it's an essential food stuff um, you know which is how farming probably should be but they they talk of the land in statements of facts that's where you plant the vineyard that's where you plant the olives and that's where you plant the zucchinis they don't have to – there's no – that's just a statement of agricultural fact. All too often in our very fashionable uh, uh, worlds, uh, we will buy any piece of land and then set about telling you how good it is uh, for whatever we choose to do on it. And, and o- o- often I make the distinction between a statement of agricultural fact and a statement of economic necessity, and the, the two don't often join. Or, or they're joined by w- w- words which, you know, uh, 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 contain varying degrees of bullshit. So you, your background kind of stemmed from, oh gosh, food science into organic chemistry, into winemaking, into being the director of Hardy's, um, BLR Hardy's, before headed over as senior winemaker to their branch in France, which was at Le Bome. And then you came back and decided, you know what, we want to buy this piece of land um, in Tassie. 
what was the landscape of beer and hops in 2004 in Tasmania? Oh, it didn't exist. I had no idea. I mean, the, 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 the problem was that on this 600-hectare property that I bought, you know, 600 hectares half the Tasmania. Um, <laughs> so uh, when I finally walked around what I bought, my first comment was, shit, I'm exhausted. Um, but there was no house. Um, and I didn't think about this as I'm, I have, appear to have problems with putting those sort of things together. Anyway, so I parked my... Jane uh, and my two young girls who were kindy age at the time. They were both born in France and um, parked them at a friend's place in Port Lonsdale and took the boat across to Tassie to welcome my new chattels in the middle of July in winter in 2004 and and stayed in the pub and – Went out on the first day on a frosty morning. I'd already teamed up a meeting because apparently in Tasmania you grow poppies uh, and I had to do something because I only I had no money. Um, I had to, you know, become a farmer all of a sudden. So I met this guy um, who was the, 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 the chap involved with growing the poppies around the state of Tasmania um, and he looked at the farm. We walked around. I'm waving my arms around and telling him this and that and it's all going to happen and dreams are falling from the sky and it's fantastic. And he's looking at me incredulously, just thinking, this bloke's an idiot. He, and he said, where's the house? Where are you going to live? Oh, I about that. How about that? Just tell me how we grow these poppies. I'll get them in the ground. Let's get going. Let's get, let's get some shit happening here. And he just – and on the way back, he dropped – he said, listen, you need to live somewhere. <laughs> what are you talking about? No, he lives live somewhere. He, he listen. And he on his way back, he dropped in to his brother's place um, who had a cottage on the Dirt River just on the edge of New Norfolk. Uh, and that was a fellow called Richard Warner who was a third-generation hop grower. Uh, and um, I'd never seen a hop in my life. And I ended up renting – he, a place next door to this, the original hop property of Australia. <laughs> the property's called Valleyfield. It sits on the Derwent River. It's remarkable. It was built in 1814. It's still this homestead with a shingle, wooden shingle roof. And it's got the original Australian hop kiln which is called an oast house, which is a round brick kiln with a conical shingle roof. Just the most remarkable buildings. But, of course, and it modelled directly on the Kentish hop kilns, except when, when, when all the English people arrived in Australia, these hop farmers came out uh, as free settlers in the early 1800s, landed in Tasmania. And they modelled the kiln exactly on what they call the Kentish host house. But because the trees in Tasmania were three times the size of the trees in Italy, uh, sorry, in England, the actual, this hop kiln structure is enormous. Like it's, it's exactly the same replica of the Kentish host houses, except it's multiplied by three in magnitude. So that's w- where I live. And I've signed a six month lease to rent this guy's house while I built my – and 18 years later, we're still here. We haven't moved. So there's no vineyard There's no vineyard on the vineyard site. There's no house. <laughs> and, and, and I'm brewing beer. But it was Richard Warner, the three-generation hop grower, who very quickly communicated to me that the actual tra- farming traditions of the Derwent Valley was growing hops. And I'd never seen a hop before, and I was just fascinated – by this guy's story, by the way he told them, by his own history, by these buildings, which, by the way, are A-class buildings, National Trust buildings of international significance. That, that's that's where I live. There's three of these remarkable buildings from the early 19th, the earliest days of Tasmania sitting on the Dirt River, and I'm immediately lost in this guy's stories of hop farming, and I'd 
and I, I've uh, all right. I'm, I'm going to. I'll, I'll brew some beer. I was very logical, isn't it? <laughs> Shanky. Well, it does sound logical, and it sounds like you know it was a big, you know, f off sign to you saying this is what you should be doing, and and you listened. <laughs> I've just fallen out of the sky. What wow, landed on this guy's front lawn? Came, came to he's standing over me saying, "Who are you?" Oh, I'm a winemaker. Well, I'm a hop grower. Uh, you know, we we get chatting, and that's that's as much strategy that went into the rest of my life. Um, but the the point that is really that I must make from the is this look. There's all sorts of differences between wine and beer, as you well know. The Great Wall of China exists between sommeliers and professionals in the wine industry, and and beer people. <laughs> I mean, for me, they're fermented liquids. But by Christ, from the manufacturer all the way through to the trade. Beer and wine are just completely different things. I'd never seized that before. Um, I had no idea. Never brewed a beer before in my life. Um, uh, but here's the point. You go to somewhere like the Barossa Valley, the Coonawarra, whatever, Burgundy, you'll see grapes. Grapes, 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 because you <coughs> all the, the wine regions all around the world, there's vineyards and somewhere very close to the vineyard, there's a winery because there's no point growing grapes if you're not going to make wine. Now, the entire Derwent Valley, from New Norfolk all the way upriver to Westaway, all the tributaries that flow into the Derwent, the Payena, the Styx, all the little river valleys dotted around for 160 years in Tasmania, the local agriculture here was growing hops. At least you can make with grapes, you can make wine, but you can also make grape juice and you can make tato raisin and all sorts of things because it's lovely. It's a fruit. The only use for hops is beer. It's a single-use agricultural. You can't make perfume or soup or <laughs> just beer and and. Here, where I'd fought, where I decided to live out my days, that's all they did. They grew hops, single-use product, and my first comment as a winemaker was, "Great, where's the breweries?" <laughs> oh, gee, gee, Dick, that's a that's a brilliant story. My God, I am so thirsty. Let's have a beer. And he said, huh? I said, well, yeah, you're, only, you're growing hops. It's all you do. <laughs> there, must be, there must be thousands of breweries here. And I had no idea. Let's go and continue this conversation in a bar with a beer. Man, I am so thirsty. This is ridiculous. And he's looking at me perplexed. What the fuck are you talking about? Do it, 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 There had never, ever been a brewery in the Dirt Valley, ever. It, 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 it's and, and I tell that story now, and most people sort of stare at me blankly. Well, I still haven't joined the dots. What the fuck are you? Why would you? Yeah, but we grow hops. But no, you, you, there's no point growing something that you're not going to use. Totally. So what, were they just shipping them back to the mainland and making things difficult for themselves? Tasmania grew back in the day. And, and, and as recently as 1967, which, you know, I was born around then, uh, grew 80% of the hops in Australia here in the Derwent Valley, 80%. Tasmania doesn't do anything at 80% of the national output. Tasmania doesn't do 80% of Tasmanian output. <laughs> and there we are growing 80% of the country's hops, and we don't have a beer here. We don't have a, don't have a brewery that, that, is, that is implanted in amongst the hops that is, you know, because beer, no one thinks about beer like that. They don't. They don't it, you think about, you're trained to think about varieties of grapes, and you're 
trained to extend your little finger in a very stylish way and 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 put on the most sophisticated accent and twirl bottles and and pull corks and ramble on about 2017 versus 2018 and how amazing and the ground and the sky and the weather and it's all influ- it's all true but no one talks about beer like that well i didn't in 2004 when i landed anyway so that's 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 the utter incongruity of my landing where I landed, and you're asking how did it happen? I don't know still. <laughs> well, I'm certainly very glad that it, that it did. So, okay, we get to the point where you have realised that the process makes absolutely no sense, and we start the process of discovery. Now, you travelled quite a bit uh, around Belgium, UK, USA, and everybody, I think, has a perception of what beer should be or how it should be drunk or what it should be, and it's different all over the world. So when you entered into deciding you're going to be a brewer, where did you start and what is the reception? I mean, what what are you dealing with at that time? (laughs) Well, it's 2004. There's no craft beer. There's Bogues and Cascade in Tasmania. There's 50 breweries in the entire country, including uh, CUB and Tui. There's no such thing as craft beer. There's the, the residual Matilda Bay um, thing of the 80s that came out of Western Australia. There's a little bit of Little Creatures, also Western Australian, but there's nothing. There's no, there's there's not, there's, there's, and I've woken up in Hopland, um, you know, come tumbling out of the sky from my winemaking career in France. Um, And, uh, but you've got to put this into context, Shanti. I'm, I'm I'm a winemaker. By training, so therefore, by by direct uh, linkage, I I know everything there is to know. <laughs> so therefore, making a beer was just yeah, she'd be right. So you asked what the what what is the first thing I did? Well, I solved the hops because Dick Warner, my landlord, was man of three generations of experience. Do have to think about that. Had all the expertise standing next to me. Um. Went to my dictionary, looked up beer, B E E R, beer. Okay, beverage made with uh, a grain, hmm, water, don't river, cool, got the water, hops, dick, standing next to me, it's great, yeast, think about that later, grain. Okay, so where do I get my grain? Right, I got a farm, cool. Well, the first thing I did, planted 80 hectares of barley. That's, that's, <laughs> That's not how you brew beer, shanty. <laughs> no, no one does that. <laughs> Eighty hectares. Um, that made me right then and there. Even before I'd brewed my first beer, that made me the only person in on the planet growing the primary ingredient for the beer he was going to make. And I hadn't even started brewing yet. I didn't have a brew house. But I planted 80 hectares of barley because the dictionary said you needed some grain. And I thought, well, <laughs> hey, I've got a farm. So, so like, you know, <laughs> don't, don't, don't take any business advice from me, please. Uh, never brewed a beer before in my life. Thought, nah, should be right. It just, just think about it like wine and, and it's beer and, you know, carry on. It's look. It's not good. It's like really not a good start, and uh, I don't recommend that to anyone. Um, yeah. So, so as you can imagine, the beer was a bit weird, but it was mine. Yeah, and I and, I, uh, and in the ensuing years, I've had all of the council. Um, and all of the suggestions, polite and otherwise, 
to um, have a look at what I'm doing and maybe improve it, but I've owned it. <laughs> it's it's mine. It's my beer and it's my way. Um, might not be to everyone's taste, but uh, it's um, it's pretty original. I can say that after 18 years. Absolutely. I thought about um, when I was thinking about chatting to you and I thought I love chatting because I love that you have had a history in wine. You've even worked as a SOM. Um, and I love that your take on things um, because you have an idea of that world. And I often think about how often we say in the SOM world things like, in search of perfection or, you know, it's after about perfecting the the product. And I, I don't know if that applies to you. I, I kind of thought, what would I say about Ashley and his and his products? And I thought maybe it's a little bit more in the search of reflection, the search of reflection of nature perhaps maybe is a little bit more of an appropriate comment on what you do year in, year out. But what did you learn after your travels um, about crafting beer or about the process of it? And then what did what was your vision for Two Metre Tall? Yeah, well, we'll just park the second bit vision for a, for a little bit because I'll have to have a think about that. I don't think there was one. <laughs> um, uh, the, but the, the first bit of, of, of the first part of the point, I'll diverge into mead. Uh, briefly, to to, to ex- explain this search for perfection sort of thing, because it, it it very much exists in my head. But I want to use meat as an example. Uh, 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 an apiarist put um, his bees on our property years ago, because um, we've got a massive part of that six hundred hectare farm that I bought. There was two hundred and fifty hectares of um, forest on the top of the hills. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a beautiful property. It's so evocative and it's got one of the last or the, one of the largest stands of blue gum, which is the world's tallest flowering plant and the floral emblem of Tasmania. I hope you're standing to attention with your hand over your heart as I say this. Um, uh, it, magnificent. So anyway, we, we end up with bees, logically enough. And, of course, if somebody put bees in my place – um, all of a sudden I'm going to make mead, aren't I? I mean, you, you can see that coming a mile off. Even though I've never made mead, I don't know how to make mead. There's bees on my property. There's honey. Therefore, it's got to be mead. I hate mead. Oh, I hated mead. I thought it was the worst drink you could pop. You know, the English meads, sweet, unctuous, uh, offered to you by people wearing grey cardigans and long beards, boring, shocking labels, awful drinks, nothing. And then all of a sudden I've got bees on my plate, right, mead. Cool. Um, we're not going to make that. We're going to make uh, an aper- dry aperitif style or something like that. You know, I'm just going to naturally ferment the thing. But the point is, I've described the latest release me, back to your point about seeking perfection. And in my own words, this is the most remarkable. It makes my the hair on the back of my ne- neck stand up. It's the most remarkable product that we've turned out into the marketplace. And it's... <clears throat> one of the principal reasons that I can make that declaration is because I had so little to do with it. I I, I didn't even harvest this. I didn't even, I made no harvest decisions, nothing. I just got this honey, which appeared because the bees did all that work and they made all the decisions and they made the primary ingredient. I just got it and I took some water from the river and then I let it go. And let it, and just let it ferment naturally for three years. It's just extraordinary, and it's extraordinary because of the absence of me. In part, so it, it. And you can't. I mean, I know winemakers and wine people waft on about terroir until everyone's gone to sleep, including them, halfway through their speeches. Um, and I don't have any problem with grapes and. And roots and soil and climate and and I do have a slight problem with <laughs> pinching the French expression, um, but that's a diversion. But have a think of if you want to think in terms of place, think about that. 
a B, taking what is there at that moment. It's remarkable. You can't get more um, absolute place than that. Because there's no decisions that, have, that are intervening here. So you get what you get. And because bees operate like they do, when they're actually making their honey, they will preferentially take what is available to them, which is utterly dependent on the season. So from the same farm, you won't get the same honey at all each year because the, the climate will be different. And that's what's happened with our mead. So we've released two so far, 2017 and 2019, and they're both ridiculously different with enormous amounts of similarity. And that's exactly how it should be. So even if you don't know the story, you can – there's a – there's a sense that we've all got if we're paying attention where even though we don't know, we do. It's like a knowledge that comes in through our palate. So without even me even being there, without me even opening my voice, if I opened those two bottles and left the room, you would be tasting my place. And that's, that's incredible. They're just speaking for themselves and doing doing all of that for you, which is pretty pretty amazing. Um, I'm, I'm I'm glad that you what you said about mead is that I I've, I'm in love with the idea of mead, but I'm yet to have a mead I've enjoyed. <laughs> um, so I've, of course I haven't tried yours yet, <laughs> but um, I've always thought this sounds like. And the mate, we should be making mead, you know. And I know there's, I've come across a few people making mead, but um, I'm uh, I'm thrilled that you are so happy with the outcome. That sounds awesome. But you work with, I mean, you make your farmhouse ale, um, you make cider, you make mead. You work with quite a lot of fruit and vegetables, um, which is not unheard of in the world of of ales and. And beer, um, but tell me a bit about the process of discovery with ingredients like that. I mean, you've you've got oysters, you've worked with seaweeds. How's that all come about? Oh well, they're there. They're 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 they're, they're there. They're available. Uh, they're grown. The the people that I've got to know uh, around me are, are, gr- are growing them, and 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 so they're part of the matrix of my farming life. Uh, and I'm a fermenter. So if I get my hands on them, I'm going to eat a bit, but I'm going to ferment most of it. So that's that's it. There's no and the the thing about the thing about wine, as good as it is, is that it is like one of my big pigs. It 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 guts all the food. It takes up all of the space, and and. And everything else is the run to the litter, because wine just, it just scoffs everything. It scoffs the news. It scoffs the attention. It's sco- it's only fucking grapes. <laughs> you can only make wine with grapes, and grapes are a bit of a weird thing to grow in the Derwent Valley. Oh, you, you can grow them, but they don't grow here on them, their own. Um, uh, they don't really belong here. They grow well here, but it's only grapes. You I mean, you can't wine. You can't make wine. With beef bones, I can make a beer with beef bones. I think I'm, tr- I'm trying. I haven't released it yet, but I'm, I've had a go. I mean, because I grow cattle and we sell beef, and then all the bones are left over, and and I'm thinking, yeah, well, I like beef soup, and mo- and it'll put a bit of malted your pearl barley in your beef soup. Very good in winter, lovely. So let's ferment it and see what happens. I had a, had a chat to a few chefs and they thought, oh, no, mate, when it goes off, it's not great. And I'm thinking, well, hold, hold your horses. <laughs> let's let's have a go. Um, do you understand? So, so beer, whilst it's in the dictionary as grain, which, by the way, grain is a very plural word, grain, um, 
hops, very plural word. Water, poo-hoo, extremely plural, plural word. Ah, about the yeast, that's just not, that's a, that's another subject. The, the point is, beer is is just a beverage made with stuff, and that's what we're doing. And I think beer's always been that. In fact, funnily enough, um, <laughs> last night um, a girl contacted me because she was writing an article about brewing and witchcraft. And she said, you got any input? Um, and I bought it to tears. I, input? I mean, brewing is witchcraft. You bubble, bubble, boil and trouble, that's all. They're just brewing beer. No one knew what yeast was way back in the medieval time. So transforming uh, grain and water and herbs and fruit into an intoxicating beverage, that wasn't yeast. That was magic. That was witchcraft. That was spells. That was people getting pissed and the changing character. You, just, you understand where I'm, where I'm at? That's that, that's brewing forever. This this can of fizzy, flavourless lager that Australians think is beer for the last hundred years. Jesus, needs to be cold too. Said by bloke is an awful, tragic disgusting reduction of beer. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? You, beer is one of the oldest drinks humans have ever produced, right? And what I don't know what it is, fifth millennium or something ridiculous that it, that it can trace back to. Like you said, before even the word witchcraft and, and, and humans had an idea of what that was supposed to be. And like I said, these days, Everyone has a very opinion opinion on what beer should be, and it means something so different to, you know, your Joe Blow up the road, as opposed to someone in the tiny farm in the south of France. Um, so it's a hard uh, it's a hard topic to kind of it must be hard to produce something and 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 market it in a way that's honest to what you do, and try and get it out there to people that want to buy it. Well, you look. You, no, 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 no one, no one wants to be me, um, uh, for very, very good reason. I mean, it's it's just stupid, uh, and stupidity. Uh, uh, but by Christ, it's fascinating. Uh, I mean, you know, you. You gung ho around with your little bunch of silver grapes on your lapel, and that's sophisticated. And you're in a, 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 an enormous amount of knowledge just to sort of, you know, f- fob yourself off as being accepted by your peers. But the, the reductionism that's been applied to beer and most consumers' perceptions of what beer can be is so reductive uh, and and so dismissive. Uh, and yet the reality that I have lived is wine is is so easy. It's a joke. Um, so I've spent I've spent 15 years winemaking and now 18 years sort of quote brewing unquote. Um, and look, as I said, I, mo- I moved to Tasmania. Um, with two young girls and, you know, family and you're supposed to behave properly and earn a job and earn a living and pay your bills and you're not supposed to wander off into the fucking distance on a fascination. Um, but I'm, I'm absolutely and utterly engulfed in it. And... Uh, you know, motivated as much by stubbornness as ignorance because the the rejection of it, and we're talking 10 good years of doing this. <laughs> I don't know who was buying it back then. <laughs> Some lovely souls workers, it's all we've done. And I'd like to find them all and give them a medal because the only ones the only ones that are memorable are the are the daily emails we used to get, mostly from other brewers, by the way. But um, pretty nasty. Yeah, I 
I, I remember you telling me a bit about that a while back in, in that you did get a little bit of hate mail coming your way from from other people saying, you know, what are you making and what is this? There was a gr- there was a story I think behind that about your cleansing ale, which is one of my f- favorite products year after year that you do the release. It's always delicious, but so interesting and and unique. Can you tell me tell me a bit about that? Uh, what the abuse or the cleansing ale? The cleansing ale. <laughs> <laughs> one attracts the other. Um, <laughs> Not so much anymore, thank God. Look, a, a lot's changed and, and a, a lot has moved on. But funnily enough, um, uh, uh, a lot of these things happen on, you know, um, social media and all of that sort of stuff. And you can trace the history back. You can go to apps like Rape Beer and you can go and search Two Men at All and you can go back 15 years and you can read all about it for yourself. Um, so I often laugh and say, um, we're a three-star brewery, but we've never got a three-star rating in our life. There's lots of fives and zeros. <laughs> but, the, but the cleansing ale was, uh, was my first beer. That was, the, that was the attempt, you know, grain, water, uh, hops, um, and yeast, which uh, I added. I had no... Intention of making a wild or sour or I have no idea. I was just making a beer. So, yeah, I threw some yeast in um, and it tasted uh, okay for a couple of days and then, boom, oh, my God, uh, shit started happening. Um, and I'm thinking, right, quick, bottle it. <laughs> that'll, that'll stop it. Um, <laughs> and that just made it worse. And uh, the next thing is quick sell it. <laughs> you can sell it and drink it before it, you know. And uh, that didn't go terribly well. A lot of it came back. Um, and it's sort of – and there are no books on there. I couldn't, I couldn't check it out or whatever the, the problem. And, and, of course, this is associated and still is taught in the institutions is ba- of bad brewing. You know, I've got an infection in my system. It's a pretty derogatory explanation for somebody who's actually – I'm sort of making – brewers make what I call uh, – and then, um, there's no uh, – I'm not saying good or bad. That's what they've done to me. I don't do that back. Uh, a, a, quote, good, unquote, brewer runs what I call an aseptic system, sterilised to a hilt, uh, pressure containers – absolute exclusion of everything except what they want to do and then in you know pitching known yeasts in a sterile manner uh, into the brew house and expressing the characteristics of that yeast and then groups of brewers will sit around together and talk for hours about the difference between XYZ123 and ABC 456 yeast all great no problems with that at all except I didn't go to that school. Uh, I was a winemaker and I was a winemaker who favoured um, uh, uh, less intervention techniques. And I got a brew house, which was one of those, and one of the first things I did was cut all the tops off the pressure vessels and put expansion chambers on because I was familiar with those with swing-top lids because I like seeing it. <laughs> And you don't do that, Shanty. You don't. That's not how you produce beer because that lets the atmosphere in, and in that atmosphere is is the microbiological content that you and I and everything else on this planet Earth interact with at an invisible level uh, every moment of our existence, um, and yet. That at a technical level, if that contacts your beer and starts to ferment, <clears throat> remembering that we live in rural Tasmania on the banks of the Derwent River, the most gorgeous surroundings known, and Tasmania is supposed to have the purest water on the planet and the cleanest air, yaggedy, 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 and this shit gets into my tanks and it's described as infected. I mean, hang on. 
Wow, well, that's a bit rough. That's right. You know, so it's an interpretation. So the cleansing ale, which had a yeast pitched into it, ended up tasting nothing like the yeast that was pitched into it. And that's a controversial beer to make. It acidified because of... And, and remembering in 2004 when I did this, I had no idea. I, I couldn't go to the library and look this up in books because it was dismissed. This, the, but this is how beer has always been brewed. It was only Louis Pasteur in 1860 where brewers were get, and it was beer that Pasteur worked up, you know, pasteurisation, Louis Pasteur. It all comes from that. That was the first time in history that mankind had identified microbiology as being responsible for the transformation of sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide, what we now know as fermentation. Up until that point, it was magic. And that includes wine. But there's centuries of beer making. Now, it's only in the last 100 years that we've gone from Louis Pasteur saying, hmm, something going on here, to um, sterile breweries, canning lines, uh, uh, aseptic beers and throwing rocks at the brewer over the road there that's letting this stuff get into his – and, I mean, it, I've got time on my side, but I don't have the industry, if you like. I'm doing it how it's always been done, <clears throat> except, except in the last 100 years. Yeah, exactly. So what in the end, the cleansing ale, what happened with all of that beer? You said some of it got put back or sent back your way. What what ended up happening to that first batch? Well, I got um, <laughs> I planted 80 hectares of barley, remember, as my first act as a brewer. Um, and my first beer, I think I bottled about six or seven pallets, uh, you know, which for a non-existent craft brewer is a hell of a lot of beer. For somebody who hasn't actually sold a case, that's a very ambitious first batch. Um, that's a lot of bottles. It's a lot of money that I didn't have. Um, and uh, it's a pretty ordinary reception. They're not only coming back, they were coming back with notes in the case and the bottles were upside down and, you know, there's a fair bit of abuse going on. Um and uh, I'm a poor, broke, tight-ass farmer. I, I just stashed it all up in my hay shed. I couldn't bear to throw it out. So there's all this unlabeled stuff sitting up in my open hay shed. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of tears. Um, uh, I also brewed another beer. <laughs> so I, I pressed on um, and I left it there. And I, I, at that stage, I was just brewing batch after batch under the uh, thinking, well, shit, if I, if I sell it a bit quicker, it'll, it won't be the problem, it won't manifest itself. And it always did. So, but, all, but oh, I don't know why I didn't think properly, but I didn't mind it. It was acidic. It was acidic, and I had a wine-making palate. So, if I had have sat down to a glass of beer, I would have said to you, uh, "It's nice. It's grainy, honey characters that you get from malt. It's refreshing, but you know what? It's a bit fat. Lacks acidity. You won't be able to. The carbonation is, you know what I mean? A bit simple." One maker of an assessment of, of, of Joe Bloggs 2004 lager beer, you know, <laughs> ho hum, not much going on there. So when this beer acidified, I thought, aha, good character that. Um, difficult one to market in beer. But by crikey, any, any quality beverage that's going to sit well with food, go in time, behave like that icon of classic beverages, wine, <laughs> it's going to have to have acidity. It's just undeniable. You know that. I know that. And there I was. I was producing acidity in my beers. Uh, so I thought, hmm, nice. Everyone else thought, yuck. 
<laughs> we got a pr- problem 101 to solve. <laughs> and instead of saying, okay, you guys, you're right, I'm wrong, I've said, no, no, listen, you're, you, you need to get your head around the fact that this is nice. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's going to be hard road, isn't it? And it was. But you did, re- you did end up doing something with all those bottles that you stashed away, didn't you? Yes. Well, uh, you mentioned travelling overseas uh, and meeting other brewers. We'd been in the game for seven years before I, we, we did that. Can you imagine? We tried to survive making a product that no one understood, not even me, and no one wanted for seven years. I don't know how we did it. It's, it's scary looking back on it, to be frank. Um, but in those seven years, from first principles and making every single possible error and mistake that you can possibly make in real time on your own money in a supposed business, the learning is extraordinary. But not translating into anything but frustration and anger and potential marriage breakup and, you know, ruining everything that I ever stood for. So that my la- I, I gave up and I said, this is not working. We're fucked. I'm going to go and work and make the wines for Kinvara just across the road, river from <laughs> where I was. It was a last ditch effort. So I, I, I applied for a Churchill Fellowship. And, I, and yeah, and you, you, you make up a project and if you can defend it through three or four hurdles, they give it to you. <laughs> Here you go. There's a bit of rope. <laughs> off you, off you go, pal. Go and hang yourself. So I did, uh, and I went overseas, and I knew nothing about the beer world, Chanty, as you do. If you're a winemaker, you, you don't care. There's no, you don't know anything about it. I've rolled up, I've rolled up at Cantillon first stop in Belgium. Strolled up to the bar. The boy's good enough to serve me one of his beers. Chain and I. Took a step back, put our nose in the glass, and thought, "Oh fuck, he got the same problems we have." And I did that for six weeks, travelling around the world, Europe, America, in two thousand and thirteen, <clears throat> and very, very specific niche breweries. Obviously, I'd done research and worked out who I might want to see and. The desire was to go and see whether I was the only bloke in the world being an idiot. I, I just thought, oh, look, I'm the only one in Tasmania. I'm the only one in Australia. I can't be the only. I can't possibly be the only one in the world. There must be somebody else doing, trying to do what I'm doing. And I came back after six weeks. <clears throat> I left a, def- a defeated guy on his on his last ditch attempt. I, I I came back to Australia with a language. Um, with a knowledge that I wasn't alone, uh, a way of communicating it better than I had, and and a little bit more understanding of what others had been through versus what I'd tried to understand. And I came back, and it's the first time after eight years of doing it, I came back and I said, I'm a brewer and I'm going to keep doing this. And at that stage, I went up to the I went up to the shed and uncorked this first cleansing ale. I've been sitting there for seven years. <laughs> I brought it back down to the cellar and I uncorked every single bottle and I put it in a barrel and I wrote on the barrel a farmer's resilience and a seven year itch. And I re released that beer, seven year old cleansing ale. I re released it to the marketplace. Uh, at a significantly higher, and it was the first time an aged beer had ever been released in Australia from a brewer, seven-year-old beer, unheard of, no one. I've been telling people to age the beer for years, but no one listens. So I thought, fuck it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release an aged beer and show them what I'm talking about. Unbelievable. Can you imagine the sense of, sense of satisfaction of sending this back, beer back to people who had rejected it seven years ago and then have them tell you that's the best beer they've ever tasted. <laughs> no, I cannot imagine that. That is an extraordinary thing for an individual, and that happened to me multiple times. Unbelievable. 
I, I mean, that's it, it's so remarkable, and I think you know, there's such a sense of you, you know, however you may put it, but I get of trusting yourself and trusting in the process of going, you know what, I'm going to see it through. And what I love as well about your beverages is that if I ask you, why does that taste like that? You will always have an extraordinary story about what happened that year or, and why, um, the simplicity of my mind says, I taste this. And then you'll give me the science behind as somebody who doesn't have the language necessarily as you do for beer. And I always learn something when I'm drinking a drink of yours. I'm learning something at the time that I'm also fascinated by something. And it's the same fascination I think that you have for what you do. And it translates when you drink your drinks. Thank you. Because it's the only thing worth hearing. Um, we we can do without money, uh, clearly. Uh, you 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 wouldn't do this in any other way. Um, I, 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 I you spent t- ten years a uh, six hundred hectare farm that we never really quite used. Certainly didn't use it for grapes. Doing something that I have no qualifications in was doing it completely wrong. You know, you imagine the years and standing in front of those barrels. I'm like you, fascinated by what I'm tasting, but it's getting me nowhere. Uh, it's an interesting sort of, I mean, I'm looking at myself thinking, mate, you're a bit fucked. <laughs> you know, if, I, if I met me, I'd, my eyes would be squinting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, there's something, there's something, a bit, there's something a bit not right with you, pal. Well, I don't know what that says about me because I don't feel that way. I think <laughs> so maybe that's more uh, says a little bit about how my mind works too. <laughs> but it's, it, look, you are, and um, can I can I just say, uh, you know, because you you won't often you won't you won't hear this very often um, outside of the wine world. Um, but I've spent now. Uh, 18 years standing in a cellar, uh, uh, a cellar which is basically its own machine at now. Um, if, if you understand that from the, uh, from the context that we're now a completely spontaneous ferment brewery. We, we don't do anything except wild fermentation. So it all happens, and to, I mean, this is not for this is not for everyone, uh, Shanti, because the, that eight, the eighteen years is a long time, um, and then it's not very long at all. Um, but to be uh, so uh, physically close and enmeshed to something so subtle. Uh, and the changes that have occurred that I've been able to observe over 18 years is one of the most remarkable um, emotional contexts uh, that uh, I, I could possibly experience in my life. You're so far down the tunnel and so close that you just have a sense for the minutia the and 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 the watching of how this rhythmical thing works in time is um i don't know it's religious <laughs> i'm not a religious person but this is my church it's an extraordinary privilege yeah it's it really for me sounds like that there was, you know, and I'm not religious either, but something larger at work in that you found that place, it was the right place for you, you know, and something was on your side there to pop you in that place where hops were going to have a part of your future and, and you know, it's it's a way of life. I, I almost had something written down asking you, what do you love about your job? And I thought, it's no, job's not the right word because it's a way of life that you have down there and, and what you do and, it's um, it's inspiring. Yeah, look, at it, and it's uh, and the funny thing is, I often uh, sort of reflect. It's um, uh, you know, you can. It, uh, 
I've also uh, it's it and it's the time it takes to do this. The time is that um, you know sometimes we go in. Uh, and you, we hear a lot of stories about people, you know, such and such. He worked all his life, you know. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but it seems to be happening in the whiskey industry a lot. There's a lot of money around, a lot of money, a lot of blokes, a lot of fucking loud voices and bullshit. And it's all of a sudden, oh, I'm in a whiskey Australian. Boom, there it is. You just think, oh, fuck. Uh, there's no sense of time. Whereas. You know, we're doing this on uh, a, a bit of fencing wire, th- three bits of string, um, and one glove without a hole in it. Um, and over a very, very long time, it's a different, you know, it sounds a bit wanky, but it's a completely different uh, experience. And, you know, that's that's why the story about the me um is, is as good a one that I can tell and, and actually saying, well, without being t- too facetious, well, if I can, it, the, 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 the less input I have, the more the product speaks for itself. And, and, in, and, and once you get into that domain, this concept that something is right or wrong is just utter nonsense. It's just it, uh, yeah. Oh, too much volatility. Ooh, fuck off. You know, you don't even begin to understand why. <clears throat> you know, I'm standing in front of that barrel before I put it into bottle, and I'm thinking, ooh, no, no gee, don't know. Why then do I put it in the bottle? Well, because it it is, and therefore it merits. It's it's not about. I have to, and and I have, I am I am yet to be let down. And and in in eighteen years, and uh, 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 I will let myself down if I make a decision. I need that raspberry wild cider before Christmas because I want it to go with the ham and I've already sent the emails out. We did that this year and then embarrassingly had to not do it because it wasn't ready. And you can all get fucked. It's not ready. It's not coming. It's not coming. (laughs) We're we're now talking prosciutto in autumn. (laughs) And nothing wrong with that. (laughs) (laughs) You're just going to have to get... You're gonna have to. You're just gonna have to get used to it. And look, we now work with some incredible people uh, that understand that, and that's a lot to ask because the the economics don't. As much as we talk about it, and as much as the chains in the system think they want these stories, it's our own fault that there's so much bullshit drowning. These beverage makers, because there is an inability to cope with people who do it properly with the delays and all, you know, they're, they're, they're economically incompatible worlds in many, so many respects. And we've, we, we've taken hits because of that. But look, by and large, eventually, slowly, slowly, we've found a remarkable number of people who can cope with this. And we don't meet, we don't meet too many. Yeah, you and you do have a, a pretty dedicated and loyal group of of customers and and followers, and that says a lot. But I think what I'm getting from our conversation today is a little bit of, you know, just shut up, surrender, and maybe just I don't know, listen, take a bit more notice of the world and and the wonder in it, perhaps. Yeah, well, look. How, how do you how do you learn, uh, Shanti? How, how do you, how do you learn n- new new things uh, 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 if you don't shut up and watch and put your faith in something? And uh, every uh, supposed rule that I was taught as a as a student winemaker, um, I've b- broken myself. Or witnessed uh, that being 
uh, absolutely and utterly turned on its head uh, in my own cellars. And I can't, so the amount of unlearning that goes into doing this task, how much learning, how much unlearning, what's the balance? At what point are you knowledgeable? We, oh, I haven't even started. We've, we know nothing. We've taught ourselves from the ground up, and I'm still absolutely in awe of what I'm seeing sometimes, even as I'm filling it into bottles and thinking, no one's going to drink this. But... It's, it's, you know, it's even down to the minutiae of volatile. I don't like volatility when it dominates. But there's, uh, you know, I'm now finding myself talking about subjects, you know, there's oxidative volatility. But we are now living in a world where you're actually getting metabolic volatility, which is a completely different beast. So if you make a if you make a universal comment about volatility, I don't like oh, volatility wine. Don't like, don't like it. But you know, uh, waiter, waiter, there's a problem with this wine. <coughs> and the, could you pass me the vinegar for my salad, please? Um, <laughs> do you understand what do you understand what I'm getting at? Um, uh, I remember the first time we put a beer, and I, it was a it was a it was a it was a, a degustation menu or something at Icebergs on Bondi, and Giorgio, the indomitable Giorgio Di Maria, uh, is serving our original sour ale. These people are rocked up. They're probably paying 250 bucks to sit there, you know, uh, plus the drinks on top of that, 10-course degustation, whatever it was. Can't remember the details. Anyway, so, somewhere in the middle of the degustation, this is years ago, Giorgio uh, lined up one of our original sour ales with a dish. And he's flying around. Yeah, they're clearing the plates and the next dish is coming out, you know, and you, these people are now warmed up on two or three wines or a couple of courses into the, the they're having an absolutely great time. And then all of a sudden this bloody madman's pouring beer into their glass and these people are waving their hands, pushing the bottle away, and I don't want a beer and, you know, how dare you and all this sort of stuff. And the response can only be a backhander, whoosh, shut up, and carry on. We're, we're, we're in charge here. You shut the fuck up. Sit down. I don't care how much you've paid. Shut up and listen. And at the end of it, they are saying, oh, my God, it was amazing. I mean, it's very difficult, very difficult, as you well know, but I tell you what, if people are resistive at the start and celebratory at the end, you have got them for life. Yes, very true. I totally agree with that sentiment. You're right because they have learned something and whether it just be a little bit about themselves or a little bit about something they didn't know, um, it, and, and you do see it come full circle in the end. So I think, you know, sticking to your guns has, has been something that has proved over time to be successful in, in, in your case however you measure that. But um, I, I certainly really enjoy learning something every time I pick up something of yours. And, uh, I mean, uh, it's, you know, I'm never surprised if I, 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 if someone said, you know, Ashley's in town and he's here and he's making leprechaun juice from the pot of gold he found, I, I wouldn't blink <laughs> and I'd just say sign me up. So now I do ask everybody on, on the podcast um, just as a bit of insight into you and your palate. Say you could only drink three beverages for the rest of your life, Ashley, what would they be and why? And you can answer that in any way you see fit. <laughs> well, I only need two. I don't even need three. Uh I need cider and uh, I need um, I need a, uh, a spirit. So uh, I would preferentially be drinking um, farmhouse dry cider, which I do. I, I, I don't give a shit what anybody thinks of our cider. That's mine. I make that for me. I drink it every day. I drink it by the gallon. I couldn't live without it. Uh, and the reason I do is the reason why if you ever go to Brittany and Normandy in France, some of the most incredible gastronomes on the planet, the food they eat is extraordinary. It's long. It's all they want to do. 
uh, and they invented the true normand, which is the shot of cal- when you're absolutely stuffed to the core. You have a shot of spirit and you start again because they don't want to leave. And that's and the point. All they drink is cider, and the reason they only drink cider is not only because they grow it there and they make it there, is because cider is the only beverage in our armory that goes with everything. You don't have to change. Now, unfortunately, cider is a bit of a swear word in the Australian market. We don't understand cider. We ignore it. A lot of the cider that's available is is how much time we got. It's shit house. It's not cider at all. It's not even made with apples. It's crass. It's crap. It's an, an awful fucking thing. You know, what's the difference between a bunch of grapes and an apple? Oh, about 50 bucks a bottle. Um, you know, it's cider is extraordinary. It's seven and a half percent of it's made properly. It is absolutely and utterly fantastic for the human body. If it's naturally fermented, it's, it's dry and it goes with a steak, it goes with the raspberries and ice cream. You don't have to move from the table. So cider, cider, cider. And then when I'm full, me personally, 80-year-old Calvados, but I'll take a hummingback if you've got it. Oh, very strong. And then we start again. I love it, Ashley. It is always stimulating talking to you it really is and I know how busy you are and I really appreciate you spending some time with me today we've only barely scratched the surface and I hope this is the start of what will be many more conversations to come Um, but I've got to get down there and see like you said stand in, in front of some of your vats and have this conversation in person as well so I thank you so much for spending some time with me and uh keep on Keep on questioning and doing everything you're doing. I love it. You will be so very welcome, Shanti. Thank you for your time and your interest. Um, It's great. Well done. (laughs) Thank you, Ashley. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Stay tuned for more stories from the world of wine and drinks. Listen in every Thursday on your podcast app. Follow us on Instagram at Over a Glass Pod and contact us at overaglass at deepintheweeds.com.au.